Genesis chapter number one. Genesis chapter number one. And I just want to remind you again that our study in Genesis here is uh, we're trying to cover Genesis uh, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and so therefore, this is not an in-depth verse-by-verse study, but I am trying to pick up on some of the topics and themes as we go through. So there's going to be times where we kind of skim through and just make some observations, and there's going to be other times where we find a particular subject that we want to sit down and dive into it a little bit, okay? So Genesis chapter number one is where we're, go- where we're at and where we're picking up. Genesis chapter number one and verse number 15. So we we talked about the lights that are in the firmament. Uh, So God says in verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And so our last lesson when we were together, we keyed in on God putting signs in the heavens. He put lights in the heavens, and God said he put them there for signs. And we talked about what those signs were, okay? Uh, it's a fun study, and, you, you know, we brought out some different things that are maybe a bit outside the norm, you know. Uh, we talked about uh, Greek mythology and some of those different things and stars falling down to the earth. Uh, I think it's really fascinating. You know, look, this book is not a dull book. You want to get into this and study what's going on, and you will be able to look back into history Because all history is, is his story, right? History is God's story. It's his story. And so everything that's gone on in history, a lot of it you can trace back to the Bible. So really fascinating things going on there, but we have to move on. I'm like, I'm I'm wanting to stay here. I want to talk about it more, but we got to move on. So in verse number 16, it says, And God made two great lights. So he's, he's got all these stars out there, but he made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. <laughs> oh, man, I love the book. He says that he, uh, here that he made the stars also. You notice how Moses, he just, he just throws it out there, right? Like God is so powerful. He made everything. And, you know, like if I were to make the stars, I would have you read a thousand-page volume on how I made the stars. And God makes everything. He speaks it all into existence everything that we've seen up to this point in the creation account. And Moses is like, yeah, and he made the stars also. I mean, the stars are innumerable. Look up in the sky. <laughs> Dennis is wearing a t-shirt. God spoke. He spoke and it happened. And so, I'm, you know, the power and the might of God is obvious from the earth. In Romans chapter 1, when it says everybody knows that there is a God, they know his testimony, it's because everybody can look around them and see that there's something powerful that made everything that is. The atheists will try to say, <laughs> like the, the people who try to deny God will just say, well, uh, nothing, this is all came from nothing. Well, how do you get something from nothing? You can't. Anybody who uses l- the, the rational brain that God gave them knows that something brought all of this about, and whatever it was is very powerful. And that's exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter number one, that the things that may be known of God are evident to them. Um, Okay, but so, (laughs) and he made the stars also. And uh, so he made the two greater lights, he makes the sun. And so in our, we think of the sun and our solar system and the galaxy and the universe. And it's, it it is, try to explain, can you explain how big the space is out there? And you look at all the stars that are out there, like you just look at our galaxy, you look at the things that are going on there. So God made all of this. And there's just this little postscript. And, you know, nothing is is too hard for our God. And it's not like it took him like a year to make the stars. It's like it's in a day where he makes everything else that's going on here. So just amazing here. Um, uh, Astronomers spend their whole life pursuing this field of study. Not astrology, astronomy. They spend their whole life pursuing this field of study, and it's just a drop in the bucket of trying to exhaust what God says in one simple statement, and he made the stars also. So that's that's pretty that's pretty amazing. But there's there's purpose in the stars. When it says that he made the stars also, he doesn't just mean that he made them as an afterthought. There's power and authority. He actually made them to rule. There are these planetary bodies that they're 
that they're designed in the heavens and they're put there for the benefit of the earth. When you start to understand the Bible, you have an understanding that God has a plan for the heavens and a plan for the earth. And God has a plan to redeem the earth and God has a plan for the heavens. And you or I, part of the body of Christ, are part of his heavenly purpose to redeem the heavens. And so that's the, it's, you, you understand that God has a purpose for both of them. And the earth is his command center of operations. And eventually God is going to establish his throne in Jerusalem and that'll be his command center uh, that, is, that is ruling over all things. Um, it'll be that way in the ages to come. Look over, at, uh, look over at Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter number 28 and verse number 10. Genesis 28, 10. It says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the, of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold, a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And so what you see, the reason I bring that up is because you understand that in the future, you have the angels ascending and descending a ladder. And, and the, the, the place where, where, where Jacob is over there in that territory is going to be a command center for the earth. Where, and it's going to be a focal point of all of creation. All of creation. Now he makes the greater light, which is the sun, back in Genesis 1. He makes the greater light, which is the sun, uh, but the moon only walks in the brightness of the sun. The moon has no light of itself, right? The only time that you see the moon is when the sun is reflecting off of it. The sun comes up because it has its own light, but the moon is only a reflection. And so in verse number 3, when God said, in verse number 3 of chapter number 1, God said, let there be light. But there was light there before he ever made the sun. And so you say, well, if there was no sun, where was the light coming from? It's because of the brightness of the glory of God. I think when he said, let there be light, it's like his presence lit it all up. And uh, so there's, there's light that's there. Um, and then in verse number 16, he made the lights that are in the heaven. Uh, in Jeremiah, talking about the greater lights, it says, uh, I'll just read it to you in Jeremiah 31, 35. It says, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night. So the, the moon is, comes out at night and it has no light of itself. It's only reflecting the sun. In Job 31, 26, it says, If I beheld the sun when it shined, or the moon walking in brightness. I love how the Bible talks about that. The moon is walking in brightness. It doesn't have brightness. It's like if I were to take a spotlight and shine it on Dennis and had him walk back and forth. It's not Dennis's light. He's only walking in the brightness. So we'll get a catwalk next, next week. Is that what they call it, where you walk up and down and strut? Because you, you put the lights out and, and you only walk in it. And as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so too should we reflect the light of Christ. As, as Christians, we don't have light of ourselves. The only light that we have comes from Christ. The only righteousness we have is what's given to us. And so as the moon reflects the sun, so too should we reflect the sun. We have no light of our own. So we don't have works of our own righteousness, but we merely reflect that which is of Christ. Light comes from life, and Jesus is the life and the light. In, in John chapter number 1, uh, I, I'm going to turn over there real quick, if you don't mind. I want to go over to John chapter 1. And in John chapter number 1, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a copy of, of Genesis chapter number 1. It's, it, it's kind of a recounting of, of creation, except telling it from the viewpoint of the Word of God. And in John chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. John was not the light. Jesus was the light. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And that's one of those verses that will just haunt you. You know, you ever come across some of those verses where you read it, and you think about it, and you're like, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's pretty deep. You see, the very creator of all existence, who is a light, the very one who made all things and the things that they made, the things that he made, they don't know him. You, met, you know how, I, I don't know yet. My kids are still young and they still either like me or pretend to like me, one of the two. <laughs> it, it, it would be difficult for me to have one of my children grow up and not want to have anything to do with me not, let's say, know me. And here who is the God of all creation, who loves perfectly, who loves so much greater than I, and he has his creation before him, and they reject him. I can't imagine what it would be like to be rejected by one of my children. I can't imagine what it's like to be God who loves us with, an un, with this, this great love, and yet men reject him. He is the light of men, and the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness didn't want the light because the darkness loved their darkness more than light. Men loved their sin more than they loved truth. In John 9, 5, it says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. So just as the sun sets and the source of light is not physically seen, today we too are to be reflecting his light because we are the children of light. That's what 1 Thessalonians 5 says, that we are the children of light. So when the sun sets and the sun is gone, where's the light coming from? It's coming from the moon that reflects the light. The sun is gone. Where's the light supposed to come from in this world? Well, it comes from his word, and we should be reflecting Christ to the world, just as the moon does. All right. Um, I want to go to, I'm, I'm going to go to verse 17 of Genesis 1, but then I want to go to Isaiah 49 and Acts chapter 13. Isaiah 49 and Acts chapter number 13. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, uh, so after he made the, the, the lesser light to rule the night, he made the stars also. And in verse 17, it says, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. To give light upon the earth. Now, the, I, I find it interesting that the hope of the, of the people who hate God, the, people in, uh, of the hope of the people who are rejecting God and rebellion against God, is they want to populate the heavens, right? <laughs> they have plans to colonize Mars. I mean, they can't even colonize earth properly. But they want to go and colonize Mars. I mean, fix the roads before you go colonize Mars, right? Um, but so they, they, they have this problem. In Psalm 115, it says that the earth, um, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth hath, hath he given unto the children of men. So God says, the heavens are mine. The earth I've given unto the children of men. And as the stars were set to be the light upon the earth, so too Israel was to be God's light upon the earth, taking his salvation to the ends of the earth. And I say this, this is important for you to understand that there's a difference between Israel and the body of Christ. And God had a purpose for Israel when he called Abraham out from the nations of the world. And he blessed Abraham and he blessed him his son Isaac and then his son Jacob. And then Jacob's 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel became a nation when God brought them out of Egypt. And God's purpose for Israel was to be a light unto the whole world. And Israel rejected their Messiah. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and in the early part of Acts, we find that Israel rejected their, their purpose. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse number 6, it says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. 
I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou might, mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. It was never a mystery that Israel was going to be a light unto the world, to be a light unto the Gentiles. The problem is, is that God extended his grace to the Gentiles, not because of Israel, but, because, but in spite of Israel. It was because of Israel's unbelief. Um, I'm going to go to Acts chapter number 13, because Paul recounts this. I, I think it's so appropriate. Uh, we're talking about Genesis chapter 1, and that, there is, that God has created the earth, that there's, uh, God has given man dominion over the earth, and that he put the, the, the lights up in the heavens to give light upon the earth. And what we find throughout the Old Testament is that God told Israel that you're to be a light to the world. And they refused to do it. And so Paul recounts this at the beginning of Paul's ministry when God calls Paul and says, I'm going to send you to the whole world with the gospel of the grace of God, with the revelation of the mystery that was committed unto Paul because of Israel's unbelief. He uses this as a testimony against Israel that they didn't fulfill their purpose to be a light to the world. And he says in Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 44, Acts 13, 44, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Who meets on the Sabbath day? That's Israel meeting on Saturdays. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Oh, the Jews, God is our God. He's not your God. The Gentiles, they shouldn't be worshiped. God is our God. But the Jews, when they saw the multitudes that were that were coming because of what Paul was teaching, the Jews were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Why, why was it they were going to have to wax bold? Well, what has Israel been doing the whole time? Stephen stands up in Acts chapter 7 and says, which one of the prophets have you not killed? when he's speaking to the leaders of Israel. The prophets come and tell you what God says, and you don't like them, and you have them killed because you like your sin more than you love God. And so these, these Jews are envious of Paul speaking these things to Gentiles. And so Paul and Barnabas wax bold because they're getting ready to say something to the Jews. And said, verse 46, and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you He's talking to the Jews, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is the pattern of that God's word goes out. It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, they, they didn't want it. They put it from them. They, they cast it out. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Whoever says that the Bible isn't filled with sarcasm? I mean, you want sarcasm. There's no one that's got better sarcasm than Paul. Well, Christ was really good at it too. You whited sepulchers. <laughs> but Paul says here, seeing as it was necessary that I speak these things unto you, but seeing you cast it away from you, seeing you put it from you, seeing that you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, I mean, who would ever want to not have everlasting life? Paul's telling them the repercussions of what they're doing. Seeing that you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For, now Paul's going to give a testimony against them. For, verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Paul is quoting Isaiah there. Look at verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. God has a testimony in the heavens, and he has a testimony on the earth. And God put those lights up there for a testimony, and God puts a light upon the earth for a testimony. All light comes from God because light comes from life. And all life flows through from our Creator. All right. Um, <clears throat> back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number, the next verse here. It's 
verse number 18. So verse 17 says, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the primary function of the sun and the moon is to divide the day, uh, the light from the darkness. And the whole story of redemption is about division, about light and darkness. You know, the sun and the moon divide light from darkness. If you want to watch a you know, you watch any, even Hollywood, which is as, about as wicked as you can get. Anytime they make something, and they make something good, and by good I mean they make money from it. <laughs> it's about a story of good versus evil. How do, and how do they portray it? Light versus darkness. Where does that come from? I, I enjoy the stories that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, that they, they made into the, to the um, Lord of the Rings series. And the, and the whole issue there is a battle between light and darkness. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm engaged by that because we're in a battle of light versus darkness. Our whole existence on this earth is a battle of light versus darkness. Your life that you live, the details of your life when you go home tomorrow, you get up and you're either going to serve Christ or you're going to serve the, your flesh. You're either going to work, walk in light or you're going to walk in darkness. Walking after the spirit or walking after the flesh. It's one of those two things. And then you become a part of the great cosmic battle that's going on. You know, the, you know as the Star Wars you know, portrayed, there is a cosmic rebellion against God. But we are to be saints in light, as Colossians said. We're not to be children of darkness. I understand that I'm supposed to be gaining ground, but I want to read a verse from you out of Jude. You understand that the angels that God created are associated with the stars, and God calls them lights. The, the morning stars sang for glory, when the stars sang for glory. And when God created his, in his creation account and the angels are all seen. Now look, at, look at Jude. The book of Jude. 25 verses in the book of Jude. Look at verse number 13. Jude is about rebellion. Verses seven, verse 7 talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 8 talks about filthy dreamers. Verse 9 talks about Michael the archangel contending with the devil when he disputed over Moses' body. Verse number 13. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. When God judges the angels, and God judges man, and he and in the final judgment over in the book of Revelation, where do they go? They're cast into outer darkness. Why is darkness the characteristic of the place that God sends the people in rebellion against him to? Because darkness is the opposite of light. And in Christ there is light. And light comes from God. And if you're going to go to a place where there is no God, what are you not going to find? Light. So they're sent to outer darkness. Paul warns us against this. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Paul warns us about the way that we live our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and look at verse number 14. Paul's talking about when, when people come together and uh, when you, maybe you're looking for a spouse and who are you going to, to, to formalize a relationship with and, and get married to. And it says in verse number 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness? Light has absolutely no communion with darkness. What happens when you turn the light switches on in here? 
the darkness leaves, right? The lights are turned on. Now, depending upon how bright the light is, you, the darkness is in the corners, right? But my point being is that you turn the lights off and what's going to fill this room? Darkness. But the moment that you put light into a place, what happens to the darkness? It flees. And Paul is saying, what communion hath light with darkness to prove the point of who should you be keeping company with? And Paul is saying, the two cannot abide together. And so we should not have communion with darkness. And a Christian that is not walking in the light is not doing as Paul has instructed. Now, I'll just, I'll leave you with a, with, a, with a fun fact for tonight. One thing that I always find to be completely appropriate on this topic. Why is it that the majority of criminal activity happens at night? Why is it, oh, that's a bad place. You don't want to be there after dark. You heard that saying, you know? Why is that? I think it's because people follow their master. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The reason why the crime happens, majority of the crime happens at night, is because the rulers of this world are rulers of darkness. And so there's a, there's a sense of spiritual uh, wickedness that likes the, the darkness. People feel more, people feel more, the people who are in rebellion against God and are in their sin feel more comfortable committing their sins at night when they think people can't see them, when they think that there's a covering. People like the darkness to hide their sins, to cover them up, and so they feel more comfortable that way. But all that does is go to show you that God created man with a conscience. If God didn't create man with a conscience, then there should be no difference between crime rates at night versus crime rates in the day. But there is, and that's a testimony to Romans chapter number one. That's a, that's a testimony to God's word and the beginning of the book of Romans that talks about how God created man with a conscience. People feel that if no one else can see them, somehow nobody knows. And even God himself maybe wouldn't know. But notice that God created the light so those who like to act out their rebellion against God under the cover of darkness feel more comfortable doing it in the absence of that light. But God created the light. And what does God say? That one day he's going to bring all things to light. Everything will be manifest. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word, thankful for your, the time that we've had in Genesis, I'm thankful for the saints that have made their way out this evening to, uh, to learn from your word and to, to talk through these things and go over them together. It's so encouraging to see the grand scheme of things and what you've had planned from the very beginning, and I pray that we see that more and more as we continue to progress through the book of Genesis. In Christ's name we pray, amen.